Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with Orlando and Patricia Haddad of the band Minas. They talked about their latest 2022 CD, Beatles and Bossa, and their life in music. As a teenager in the 1960s, native Brazilian Orlando Haddad fell in love with the Beatles and credits the Fab Four as the inspiration for becoming a musician and later immigrating to the United States. During the same time, American Patricia King had fallen in love with Sergio Mendes and Brazil 66 while experiencing the Beatles by osmosis through her older siblings. The new arrangements on this album were so well received that fans have since been asking for the recording. And here it is, after four years and a result of this pandemic. They have over four decades performing together in a variety of formats, and their story is one you should hear. Enjoy. Again, thanks for taking a minute out for Neon Jazz. I appreciate it. Sure, our pleasure. So what is it like to cover the world's most famous band in Bossa? <laughs> It's a lot of fun, to tell you the truth. Because, uh, you know, you have these amazing songs that so, so many people know. And we're able to uh, just transform them into something else. But it's still, you know, Day Tripper is still Day Tripper. You know what I mean? For sure. Well, what do you learn about the Beatles when you get that close to studying their music? I mean, we all understand. I mean, I'm a big Beatles fan. We all understand what it does to us as listeners. But... As a musician studying their music and then interpreting it, what kind of appreciation or revelations did you have? Well, you know, I was really struck how the lyrics are timeless. They're so relevant to today, and, you know, you can still identify with what they're expressing. We also were really taken aback about how complex their music is, that there are a lot of odd meters and meter changes and key changes and so you know it sounds effortless on the outside but there were a lot of you know um, complex you know inner structures that were interesting to discover. I, I no, grew up with the Beatles in, in Brazil so I grew up with both the Beatles and Bossa Nova. Bossa Nova was brand new music. I was probably about uh, nine, ten years old, and I, you know, kept watching on the black and white TV all these Bossa Nova programs with Elise Regina and uh, Marcos Valle. And, uh, João Gilberto was not in Brazil at the time. He had come to America. But uh, I also was really into the Beatles, uh, playing rock music, electric guitars. and So the Beatles music is, is so w a, a part of me that it's very natural for me to play a Beatles song. And then when we had this project going, um, I started using those songs with Brazilian rhythms, and they fit so well. Um, we started playing for, for neighbors and said, hey, check this out. And they would look at us and say, wow, that's so natural. It sounds like this music's always been like that. You know, it's the interesting thing about Boston is there is an author, I can't remember his name right now, it'll come to me when we get off the phone, but he wrote a, a fictional story about if Charlie Parker was still alive, he made this Boston album and kind of said it as if it was really happened. And it's an interesting story. So a couple of Polish jazz musicians made a album called Charlie Parker and Bossa. So you got to check it out. It's very interesting. I'd like to check that out. That sounds good. I mean, it's it's a real, like, fiction turned into reality, not with Bird, but a couple guys that revered Bird. So, you know, uh -huh. especially as a guy from Kansas City, I love Boston myself. It's a great mix. So, uh, uh -huh. yeah. so have, have you had much time to listen to the album? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I love the way that I, I love the sound. I, I, you know, I love listening to the interpretation of, of the Beatles, and I think it's wonderful. I mean, packaging's great. The artwork's very wonderful and clean and bright and inviting. I really like it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Talk to me a little bit about the beginnings of this project. How did you kind of come across the idea of wanting to cover the Beatles, and what were your early influences that really kind of became what this album is sounding like? Well, you know, Sergio Mendes was really one of the first to, to, to cover Beatles songs. You know, he did Norwegian Wood, he did Day Tripper, and then he did The Fool on the Hill, which was really a, 
a very successful album of his. So the idea of doing Beatles with a bossa nova and a Brazilian sound is not really our idea. We just uh, stretched the idea a lot farther, you know, by using different Brazilian rhythms. We, we not just used bossa nova, but we used some of the other rhythms that I had listed on the album cover. The frevo, the marcha rancho, partido alto, axé, uh, the samba itself, you know, within you, without you. It's almost like a free jazz, uh, Miles Davis, bitches brew kind of uh, experiment. I guess the only other part of this is it could be kind of a hybrid question. Talk to me about your childhood growing up and how jazz became your life and obviously what you what you are right now and what you produce. Well, in my life, um, I, I was actually growing up and doing a lot of musical theater as a kid and doing a lot of improvising on piano and writing songs, and I got into jazz probably in, you know, junior high school. I was just listening to stride piano, ragtime, and blues. And so that just developed into, you know, listening to more uh, mainstream jazz. And, you know, then as I got into college, you know, that's when Chikoria and Liza Feather and, you know, Stanley Clark and everybody was, you know, into the Brazilian vibe and, um, you know, I also grew up on Sergio Mendes. I I was really in love with them as a, as a kid. I was playing Brazilian music before. You know, I was even listening to rock. That was just my thing. I loved jazz and Brazilian music. So, by the time I got to college, and you know, I met with Delando. Um, you know, we started you know just collaborating and um, building our group from you know, that sort of um, music that we have filtered through our lives. And I made a transition to jazz from fusion rock. You know how I was more into, well, I had a band in Brazil that did a lot of uh, hits that were popular there. So that included local Brazilian artists as well as international artists. So we played everything. So... um but I was mostly interested in progressive rock. I was really, in my late teens, into bands like King Crimson and Yes. And then I got introduced to uh, Chick Corea's Light as a Feather and Return to Forever. So I got into that kind of uh, Mahavishnu Orchestra. And I came to the States to, uh, to go to college for music, and I studied classical music. So, But jazz was really... I was making a transition into jazz at that time. So that's how I came about becoming a jazz musician, mixing all those elements. And bossa nova really is uh, the fusion of samba and jazz. You know, it's interesting. I, I will never, ever forget this with King Crimson. One year when I was in my 20s, I went to a Lollapalooza in Kansas City, and it was Lenny Kravitz was the headliner, and it was after he cut his hair and everybody freaked out. And uh -huh. I remember King Crimson opened up for him, and no one knew who they were. I didn't. I wasn't musically advanced enough. But there was a dude sitting next to me, and he was like, if you guys know anything, it started going through Robert Fripp and the whole band. It was like, this is the best thing that you're going to see your entire lives, and I will never forget that. And it, it, it was definitely something I've never, ever seen before. But the pairing with Lenny Kravitz was quite unique. Wow. Uh-huh. <laughs> Levy must have been pretty young then. Oh, yeah, he was. Yeah, and he had that real gonzo gal on drums, and her hair was everywhere, and they were they totally rocked out. I mean, I remember he had, like, you know, the gold on, and that crowd went absolutely crazy. It was in the summer, and it was at the height of his powers. It was wonderful. What year was that? Oh, man, that had to be, like, 97, 98. Yeah. yeah, it was it was quite anyway, but every time I hear King Crimson I always think about that dude who was just like you have to listen to these cats. They will lead you <laughs> to what you need. It was like it was like the pearly gate Saint Peter was trying to lead you through, you know. So um it, it, it was wild. So you've been at this for decades and decades, making music. What's been the key to your longevity? <laughs> making a living. No. <laughs> I I get that. Well, you can answer that first. Well, I was going to say a lot of discipline, you know, meditation, yoga, 
just a desire that, uh, you know, we are independent artists. We don't have people that do it for us. We do it ourselves. All our albums are self-produced and self-financed. And so we just keep on going because this is the only thing we know. This is the only thing we do is, uh, you know, we do some teaching, but it's not our passion. Performing and then keeping our band going is really what's, uh, you know, it's the carrot at the end of the stick, you know. Yeah, I think also, you know, you as an artist, you're always living off of your inspiration. And luckily, you know, you wake up in the morning and you get inspiring ideas or you know, want to you think of new projects to do. And it's really a gift to have that, you know, that, that sort of electric, you know, pull, you know, feeling pulling you along. And, you know, we keep each other going too as a couple because, you know, as human beings, sometimes one is up and the other one is down and one is pulling the other along, as, you know, when necessary. Um, but, you know, we're pretty much like music monks. Everything is, you know, geared around being prepared for the gig, being rested, eating well, you know, knowing our music and just trying to go out every time and do the best we can. So let's say you have a dream tonight and you both are in the dream together and you can give your younger version as a couple advice based on the wisdom that you've gained, let's say since 1978 when you met in North Carolina. What advice would you give your younger, your younger couple selves? I would say you stick to your dream. You know, it, it will come. Just work hard at it. Don't be discouraged. Yeah, I think you just have to, you know, really believe and be relaxed about you know, what you're doing and try to take the fear out of it, uh, out of the unknown, you know, as an artist, and to really be yourself, really not try to make yourself a product for anybody else, but to really do what you love and what really stirs your passion. So you've clearly been on a lot of stages throughout the years, and you love performing live. And my question is, as the world opens up, we're kind of at the end of this two-year COVID thing to a certain degree. People are performing more. What do you hope we all, performer and audience, collectively realize about the power of live music as we get back to it? Well, one of the things that we have that have impressed me the most about reactions of the audience is how our music has the power to make people feel good. I remember playing a concert and a woman came to me. She was very serious, and I thought she was going to ask actually say something negative. And she said, let me tell you something. And I said, uh-oh. And she said, I live with pain every day. Tonight, for the duration of your concert, you made me completely forget my pain. Thank you. Wow. And my jaw just dropped. I, was, I never forget that comment. And then lately, um, people have been telling us, they say, you know, I guess because of the pandemic and, uh, even during the pandemic, when we were doing a lot of broadcasting from home, the audience would say, "You, you know, you took away that fear that we all, you know, for for a while at least that we've had about, you know, about the pandemic and and all that." So lately, we've been getting a lot of comments that our music makes people feel good. The fact that we all experienced the absence of music and the absence sense of social being able to be, you know, physically close to people, it, it just made people really realize, you know, that how much music and art is needed. I know people who came to the first performances, I heard over and over again that they, without expectation, they just broke down and cried because the, the music coming back into a live situation just, you know, really moved them. We can't live without music. Music is provided for so many ceremonies and events in life. So um, I hope the big people, the corporate people, <laughs> understand that. <laughs> you know, let's say you, you come to Kansas City to perform a show, and you have to come up with uh, a way of writing a social media release or something for one of our, our newspapers here to get people to come see you perform. Tell me what you would say and what would your show be like in Kansas City? I guess we would keep it up a little upbeat. We would uh, 
play some of her bluesy numbers at first? <laughs> well, I think, you know, I think the thing about Brazilian music is there's a lot of joy. You know, there's, there's a very uplifting quality because of the rhythm. Um, I think the music, music is poetic. I think the lyrics are meaningful. And so, you know, I, we always invite our, you know, audiences to come out and celebrate and enjoy and, you know, experience, you know, a listening event, you know, where you, and, you know, to celebrate. So I, I just feel those qualities are, are very special about the music. And the sensuality of the music. The music is so sensual that I think that appeals to a lot of people. Well, it's wonderful. I appreciate you taking time out to talk about the album, your life and music, this war we're in right now. And good luck with everything as we move forward. Well, thank to you. It's wonderful to talk to you and wish you the best of luck on your project. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview. We give you a bit of insight into the finest players and singers in North Carolina, Brazil, Kansas City, and spots all over the globe giving fans all that jazz. Thanks to both Orlando and Patricia for their time, music, and story. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. And for everything Joe Domino, go to joedomino.com. And if you feel like it, you can contribute through PayPal or Patreon at that side. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.